Actually kind of in the mood for cards. Care for a round of Gwent? I'm always in the mood for Gwent. Well, welcome to Half Glass Gaming. It's a meeting of the minds where we rap about the merits of video games, both old and new, shouting, laughing, and shooting other people's ideas down. As always, I'm joined by my two cohorts of conversation, my Dagwoods of discussion, my Aider and my Abetter. To my left, I have the ribald, the rambunctious, the rousing Reverend Nate. Sometimes I'm Reverend Rebecca. And the Joker to my right, leaving me stuck in the middle with you, I got Josh. What you gonna do when these 24-inch pythons come <laughs> crashing down on you? Where to then? Just Josh is, is fine, I mean. Just Josh. And I, of course, would be doing myself and all of humanity a great disservice if I also didn't introduce our oracle of omniscience, our forager of the farthest flung facts, Mandy. <laughs> and, of course, I am, as always, the Mumford to your sons, the captain to your Tennille, the KC to your JoJo, the moderator for this forum. I'm Julian Watkins. Now let's cut the shit. I just realized we, we have the same initials. That is why I'm going to call you Josh Get to the Chopper. I will never get tired of making jokes about your name sounding like a helicopter. Word, 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 word. <laughs> it's it's not, that's not even what a helicopter sounds like. I don't care. Did you guys ever watch MacGyver? There's an episode where he was stuck in this prison camp, and he like one of the ways he escaped is he put a spatula, he like duct taped it to a ceiling fan. And turned it on really fast, so it made this like doop, 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 doop noise and like yeah. played it over the speakers. So they thought there was a chopper attack oh, coming God. in. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of good show. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I don't think I've ever really watched MacGyver. Nobody's really watched MacGyver. I watched the crap out of MacGyver, but I was like 11. Like yeah. I said, nobody's ever really watched MacGyver. <laughs> I wasn't a real person yet. <laughs> exactly. You were 11. Children aren't real people. Right. Well, you're never really a real person until after you've seen MacGyver. So I think <laughs> you've got a one-up on us there. I went to the same college as, as Richard Dean Anderson. Wow, I was struggling to remember his name. And there you go. Pulled it right out well, of the Well, I mean, we're alumni together. Well, of so. course. I'm sure you guys are uh, still catching up on the newsletter. This is, this, is, this is great how we're spending all this time in a gaming podcast talking about not games. Well, you got to get the not games out of the way first. Right. So I've been hearing some things about a game called Ark. My first argument was going to revolve around how uh, I think modern gaming is doing a lot of things that even two and three years ago we didn't even think was possible. And I think a good example is Ark which is a survival, basically a picture Daisy with mm -hmm. dinosaurs. Daisy with dinosaurs and good. <laughs> I mean, I believe you start out like completely naked and you've got to like scavenge for your shit and you can like eventually build fortresses and train dinosaurs. I was just talking with someone the other day and I was like, you know what game needs to exist? A game that's like a survival game with dinosaurs. Like why has no one made that and then a week later they sent me the trailer for art so you got dinosaurs you got yeah you're you surviving got, it's so hard to explain because there's very little context outside of like daisy or maybe minecraft so in other words if by some amazing chance you have future technology that can run the game without a problem uh, because they they consider fifth generation i7 to be minimum specs you should totally buy that game it's eventually coming for PS4 and Xbox One, I believe. So me and me and uh, Jules with our sweet PS4s. Yeah. And I will continue sitting here with my third generation i7 laptop, praying that my hard drive doesn't die before I can afford another laptop. <laughs> which, which, by the way, you spent almost three times as much on that laptop as I spent on my PS4. <laughs> That's true, but this laptop can do so much more than your PS4, like add mods to Skyrim. That's coming, though, especially if you own an Xbox One and a it, Fallout 4. It, it, that is now coming. Yeah. But I would not have been able to do it before, and therefore the laptop was the more intelligent purchase. Like, I, I look at a console and I go, wait, wait, so when I'm playing Skyrim, I can't completely change up the perk system? I can't add a whole bunch of new clothes that Skyrim doesn't have? I can't have new awesome hairstyles? 
I'm not interested. I really just like the game, so I take whatever I can get. I mean, like, I get that. And, and I probably played for like two or three hundred hours uh, without any mods at all. So it, it is a fun game, but, you know, all the modding ability took Skyrim from two or three hundred hours, which I get it. Oh no, only two or three hundred hours of playtime. Uh, but it took it from that to, oh, let's take a look at my Steam library here. 1,727 hours. We're undecided on PC versus console, mm-hmm. but I think uh, modern gaming is totally winning this conversation right now. Obviously. Well, yeah. only okay, if modern, modern gaming is Skyrim. I guess it's a good point to really draw a line in the sand. What do we quantify as modern and retro? Where does the line go? For the sake of our discussion, let's say PS1 and 64 and older is retro. Sure. And PS3, Xbox 360 and newer is current? Does uh-huh. that does that work? For I, I I feel like PS3, Xbox 360 is absolutely current. Because yeah, they're still. I mean, they're still supporting it. So I yeah. guess that's the that might be a good way to define it if the hardware is still being supported. Yeah, because they're they're not supporting PS2 anymore. Well, no. Here's the defining point: if GameStop doesn't sell it. <laughs> Although GameStop just started up their uh, retro pro Now they'll just throw that out of the fucking whack. Come on. Right? <laughs> oh, jeez. That's GameStop. what you get for not keeping up with the news. That's what I get for looking to GameStop. <laughs> yeah, that's what you get for, for looking to GameStop. <laughs> for anything, really. Yeah. Which, there's a thing that bugs me about modern gaming. I'm not against DLC. I think the basic concept of DLC is fantastic. I like, you know, I look at one of my favorite games ever, Final Fantasy VI on the Super Nintendo, and if I could have purchased, like, given Squaresoft, they were Squaresoft at the time, now they're Square Enix. Or for the hip um, kids, Squeenix. Um, <laughs> uh, if I could have paid Squaresoft $10 to have a new seven-hour uh, side storyline in Final Fantasy VI, I would have considered that $10 well spent. Mm-hmm. So I am I am not against DLC. I am against the fact that a lot of uh, game publishers seem to see DLC as a free get-more-money button. Like, DLC should be, here's a new quest line. DLC should be, here's something that adds things to the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm even forgiving of, like, day one DLC, but when you've got, like, new costumes or shit, fuck you, that's not DLC. Or, like, Capcom... Uh, the the on disc DLC that pissed everyone off, not because it was on the disc, but because the fact that it was on the disc pointed out to everyone that you already even programmed that you assholes. Sure, so I'm gonna grab this by the reins and I'm gonna pull it back onto some sort of a semblance of well, trail. That's, that's why you're here. We're talking about DLC. We gotta talk about The Witcher Three. Witcher The Witcher Three's DLC plan is ridiculously cool. Every week since release, or like the week after release, I guess. Two items of DLC are released. It's free. It's going to be some alternate clothing or See, minor if quest. Or if some... it's free, I'm a lot more forgiving. Absolutely. If it's free, then it's one of those situations where, why the fuck are you complaining? It's free. Because I own the game. I haven't bought the season pass, but every week getting you know free armor or some ridiculous alternate costume for some of the female characters in the game that, you know... <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, the female, the females who don't understand that shirts have buttons on them, and yeah. like, hey, I can, I can close this thing. Yeah. Like, you know, would I, you look at that? I don't care if female characters are in ridiculous non-top buttoning outfits. I just want clearly etched out cock bulges in return. I just want an equal amount of sexualization of the guys. Mm-hmm. And wearing a thin shirt when you have a muscled chest is not an equal amount of sexualization because we don't see guys' chests the same way as we see women's chests. Guys are going to have to show off some cock if you want to make it equal. Show me the cock bulge, guys. Well, okay, now, nudity, is that something that you would consider... You can attribute to current gaming uh, that's never really been a form of retro gaming? or In the early 90s and mid-90s, FMV games were a thing on PCs, and you could totally have nudity on FMV games because they were full-motion videos. Well, you can even find examples earlier than the 90s with things like Custer's Revenge in uh, 1982 
And uh, Leisure Suit Larry in 1989. And Leisure Suit Larry is actually a remake of a 1981 game called Soft Porn Adventure. It was a text only game, so it didn't have any actual nudity, but there was nudity on the box art. Yeah, that was actually a, a, a really weird story. Like, the models on the cover were actual um, Sierra employees. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't Sierra yet. It was uh, online productions or online systems. They would eventually become Sierra, and they just had their employees nude in a hot tub on on the cover. And a waiter. Yeah, and a waiter, and they hired a waiter to, <laughs> to be on their cover. <laughs> I want to say the very first game with actual nudity in it, because Soft Porn Adventure was just a text game. I think the first game was called Nightlife, and it was published by Koei, even before Custer's Revenge. It was the same year, but it was earlier in the year. The thing about the Atari porn games was that when the Atari came out, video games hadn't started being marketed as a kid's toy. It wasn't that they were exclusively for adults, it was that... They weren't exclusively for kids. Yeah, I think what it, what it was was, you know, Atari was sort of also geared as this family hub. And so you'd get a variety of games on there, and some of them were kid-specific, but there was no ESRB or nobody sort of watching the store. So it was like the Wild Wild West. You got a guy smoking a joint. All of a sudden, he's coming up with some ridiculous game with flying dicks. Or <laughs> Julian, this was in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. They were doing cocaine. I think it was actually more ethereal than that. Just some guy, some hippie, <laughs> smoking a joint, like, hey, man, like, look at that. That thing looks like it's invading from space. That, that big circle, what if what if we also put ghosts in there? Yeah. Because aren't ghosts in everything, really? They're inside our bodies, man. Right? <laughs> We're all pregnant with ghosts. We just have to die to give birth. <laughs> I, I kind of wish I was stoned now. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in Motocross Madness 2 for the PC, and I, I want to say this is 2001-ish, there were a bunch of nudity mods, but like all people did was uh, color the motorcycle drivers in like flesh tones. Mm-hmm. They still had their helmets on, they right. still had their goofy looking outfits, but everything was just flesh colored. Right. It was well, so ridiculous. The same was like images of Laura Croft from the oh, PS1 Tomb Raider game. I spent so games. many hours trying to jump off that diving board <laughs> into the pool hoping to uh, come out with her clothing removed to no avail. Meanwhile, I was sitting there wishing there was a Leon Kennedy nude mod. Why can't I see some cock? Well, there have been cock. I mean, there has not been nearly enough cock. I'll give you two examples. Well, actually, both of these are Rockstar games. The first, Manhunt, the pig-headed guy running around with the chainsaw. He's got a dangle going on. So there's Jim Manhunt a has, takes on a whole new meeting. And, right. uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, the Ballad of Gay Tony. Okay. There's now there was a um, dick in that one. Uh, games where we saw guys completely nude. But half of these games were like first-person games where if you glance down at one particular point, you happen to see a dick. I think the problem is is that they spent so much time getting the boob jiggling technology right. They have yet to really focus on the dick yeah. swing technology. Cock, cock, cock jiggle. Yeah. I mean, that's still a ways off, I, I feel. I feel like they could easily take the boob jiggle engine mm-hmm. and transfer that into cock jiggle. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a possibility. I mean, case in point, you never see like a really good elephant trunk. They're still working at it. And like Far Cry 4, you got elephants, and that's that's about it. Yeah, but they're although, stiff. Far, although, Far Cry 4 actually had, had a, some dangle going on. So Sega is publishing, and Game Freak is developing, a game uh, called Timbo the Badass Elephant, which I got to preview for one of my various video game journalism jobs. It follows the old 2D Sonic formula, where it's built in such a way that you want to go fast, and usually the game rewards you for going fast, but sometimes you have to pull yourself back and pay attention to the obstacles and deal with the enemies and etc, etc. And it's a lot of fun. It's really well done. Uh, But I guess what this proves is that Sega can have another good 2D Sonic game. They just can't actually make the good 2D Sonic game. And they can't make it a Sonic game. It has to instead be a badass elephant. They've even they've even revisited 2D Sonic in the past with not very great results. The so like Sonic 4, they got the physics completely wrong. 
the the only thing they've really figured out to do with Sonic is like, let's make this a faux racing game. Let's have him grind on rails as he encounters <laughs> them. And like, the controls are terrible. In the in Sonic Two, the half pipe, you have a ton of control. It's like it's like a three D Sonic game because it's it's three D and you're going on a half pipe and you can you can dart back and forth super fast and you know get all the rings and and whatever. Then you play an actual three D Sonic game and your your movement is so limited that it's not fun. Mm. Let's be honest, Sonic Adventures 2, Rouge the Bat and and Knuckles were fucking. There's so much goddamn sexual tension between them in that game. Boy, is she going to be surprised when she finds out echidnas have four penises. <laughs> but yeah. Is no, that no, science? No. Is, is, is that true? Yes, echidnas have four penises. The unfortunate thing is that we'll never actually see the echidna penis in any game because the dick jiggle technology hasn't quite advanced that far yet. The problem is simulating the fulcrum and the uh, pendulum effect. <laughs> you know, the there are there are Skyrim mods that have dicks jiggling around. If a Skyrim modder can do it, I think a AAA game can have some jiggling cock bulge. We're getting close. Uh, let's switch topics. Let's keep it a little bit above the waist for this next uh, uh, round. And, and I promise nothing. Well. All right. Well, let, let me ask you. What, where does your affinity for retro games come from? Uh, nostalgia. Mm. I mean, it, I would be lying if I said that there's not a lot of nostalgia wrapped up in retro gaming. And I think anyone who says that there's not uh, is either really unself-aware or they are lying. There are objectively... A number of things about modern games that are better because they can do more with modern technology than we could do with retro technology. That's just how things work. Uh, That said, I feel like a lot of retro games were much tighter and more focused. And it was a simpler time. I feel like uh, the retro games had a lot more simplicity to them and... There's a certain beauty in simplicity. There's a certain amount of just enjoyment in playing just what it is. You know, like the the old 2D Mario games, you didn't have to worry about all this extra stuff. It was just jump on the platforms and bop on the enemies, and that that's what you did. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's, there's a beauty in the simplicity of it. I think that's an interesting point, because if you think about it, technology wasn't there to sort of flash out the peripheral. Right. So you could kind of make your own fantasy within these games. You know, now that you play a game like, let's say, like Skyrim, you know, is it almost too developed where that, to occupy the player's mind, they have to create encyclopedias of books that you can read while playing it and, you know. See, I I don't think they have to. I think in a lot of games they try to without really trying to. Mm -hmm. Like, I think why Skyrim worked is because they went out of their way to completely flesh out as much as possible. The books, for example. Skyrim didn't just have a couple of books that you could read. There was a shit ton of books with some very interesting shit in them about the lore of of the setting, about random bizarre bullshit. There was one book that was actually a choose-your-own-adventure story, Kolb and the Dragon, that was really entertaining. Uh, Whereas I feel like a lot of games would have a few books that you could read because that was popular in Skyrim Mm -hmm. or popular in some other game. And, like, I feel like you can't do that. You Mm -hmm. either have to commit yourself to the ridiculous idea or you have to not do it. I remember in Wild Arms, I was disappointed in the books you could read because you would pull a book off the shelf and open it up and it would be, like, a sentence. Right. And I was like, why did they waste a whole book on this one sentence? Right. Yeah. You know, that that kind of stuff. And that always... Or, like, um, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. There was, like, the one library. Yeah, it was, like, was four say, books. Yeah. At least in Pokemon, uh, eventually they started having more books. And some really bizarre shit in some of those books... The, the fifth generation had a book that pretty much stated right out that humans are Pokemon. Hmm. Things like Max Payne with the television shows. Yeah. You know, it completely broke the narrative to stand there for eight or nine minutes and, you know, watch, quote unquote, an episode of 
the uh, fake Twin Peaks program they had in there. But uh, oh man, I need to play this. Game. It was great, you know. <laughs> All but right. in Alan Wake, they had that, and then also they had um, a local radio show that you could listen to, and the guy would be like, well, it's getting to be foggy out there, you know, <laughs> and we're going to leave you with some tunes, and then you could you know, play some songs, and it was bizarre to just have Alan Wake standing there, uh, looking for his lost wife, fighting shadow demons, listening to some <laughs> 3 a.m. disc jockey, but uh, I like that. The GTA was always good with that stuff, though. Mm -hmm. You're driving around, and it's like these ridiculous radio programs. Yeah, I feel like games that decide to do that when they actually go all in with it, it's great. And when they just have it to sort of have it, it's never as good. Mm -hmm. GTA 4, they had the uh, history of Liberty City on the television. Did you go watch? Yeah. Um, It was like a history program that sort of detailed the beginnings and in in growth of liberty city and there were supposed to be three episodes for some reason they only had two i thought the battle of gay tony would come with the third one but they never went there got canceled <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Freaking a meals in readings <laughs> <laughs> always watching this shit <laughs> right you know it makes me think of animal crossing uh there was one game where Every Friday at like 7 p.m. at the cafe, there was a dog guitarist playing. Yeah, K.K. Slider. So my friend had a friend uh, who was having a really difficult time in his life. Uh, You know, lost job, etc., etc. But every week... He would make sure to like get on online with uh, his buddies and go to the cafe to listen to the dog sing and play. And that was how they knew the guy was still doing okay, because he would make it there. And if he wasn't there, like the friends would converge on him in real life and go, okay, dude, what's, what's wrong? What's happening? You know, here's people who came together and found a way to help each other through this really ridiculous little once a week for one hour snippet on a video game. Mm -hmm. I feel like when games go all in on that shit, that's the kind of stuff that happens. People like react to it and find ways to make it part of their lives because it's hilarious and it's interesting. One game that kind of gets overlooked for something like that, I think is Fallout 3. With uh, the the three dog disc jockey, where you know the things that you do, he'll comment on. But there is a point you can actually kill him, and he's replaced by a less charismatic disc jockey. <laughs> you know, right. I think like an example of what you were talking about, Reverend, uh, is Bastion. How the, uh, narrator <gasps> the narrator is literally there with you. And yeah. then you walk down the corridor, and you're like, well, shit, I guess I gotta walk down the corridor. No, I, I do. I um, want to do stupid things all the time. Yeah. Bastion, just because I love he the narrator so crates much. like he was crazy. It's like... <laughs> like the and Stanley well, Parable? Th- right, I was yeah, just about to go. mention that. The Stanley Parable is... I feel like it's one of those few games that is genuinely exploring the concept of art with video games. Like, how is video games, as a media, different... From all these other art forms and what can we do with it Mm -hmm. and it's playing with the concept of narrative versus player choice Mm -hmm. i was talking with a film studies professor um last year we were talking about how film became respected as an artistic medium and the arguments a lot of the films as art people were making back then was uh, this this is what a film can do that a novel can't do. This is what a film can do that a uh, stage performance can't do. Mm-hmm. And so they eventually legitimatized film as art by exploring all of these facets that make film film and using that to tell stories they couldn't tell in other mediums. I think games as art is the same exact thing, where Braid, for example, wouldn't work as a film because the final scene involves you taking part, you being in control, you performing these actions is a huge part of what makes the story impactful. Or Shadow of the Colossus, if you weren't the one interacting with the colossi, the ending wouldn't resonate so well. Mm-hmm. There's a, an indie horror game called The Last Door that I really like, and the very opening finds you in a room 
and uh, you're looking around trying to figure out what to do and you're gathering a chair and gathering a rope and eventually you realize you're getting the tools for this character to kill themselves and you don't want to do it, but it's the only thing you can do to progress mm -hmm. the story. And so you don't know this character, you know nothing about them, but because you're directly involved in their suicide, their death has a huge impact on you. Mm -hmm. That's a type of storytelling that only video games can do. Right. And I, that's, yeah, like that's how video games are going to be seen as art. And that's, that's the art. And I think that as much as it pains me, I think we, if we're going to look at the media uh, as adults, we have to accept that just because we like it doesn't make it art. And just because we don't like it doesn't make it not art. All right, I'm going to take a moment to let the dust settle. I'd like to thank GeekParty.com and RetroVolve for hosting and... 2XAA for the kick-ass intro music, and of course, Wheelie for his contributions as well. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we're going to talk a little bit about Gwent, and while we're at it, maybe even The Witcher 3. Ah, who am I kidding? We're always going to talk about Witcher 3. You know him. You love him. Let's he can look. walk around without a shirt on in the goddamn game. He's Geralt Rivia. He plays a mean game of Gwent. He plays a mean game of everything. Because he's on this like time-sensitive mission where he's trying to find Siri, and he's like, like, oh, I have to get to the next town. Yeah. Like, maybe she's there. Maybe I'll catch up. But he's got time to throw down some cards and play a mean hand of Gwent. He does. Do you think uh, the packs of Gwent come with those hard uh, sticks of gum? For those of us who have never played The Witcher 3, how the fuck do you play Gwent? How, how does this card game work? I mean, it's kind of like playing War, like if you've ever played the card game War. Right. Only you have three rounds, and if there was only one round, it would be a really shallow game, but there's three rounds... And so that adds this level of strategy. Right. Where sometimes you might want to lose the you, first round. Right, to... Strategically lose the first round. Mm -hmm. And there's then there's other cards that grant certain effects and things. Like there's the spies, which are my absolute favorite, which you place on your enemy's board and it gives your enemy points, but it allows you to draw more cards. Right. One of my main strategies that I'm using right now is I have two uh, two spies in my deck and I'll play both of them right away. So I'll have more cards than my opponent, but then I'll lose that round because right. they have all of my points. And then I'll come back because I've got like, you know, three or four more cards than my opponent and I'll come back and win the next two rounds. Okay. I think my favorite thing about Gwent is not even the game itself, but is like Geralt's one-liners before he plays. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Geralt, I hear he's here. Do we have a... <laughs> Do we have Geralt in the room? I wouldn't mind a few rounds of Gwent. <laughs> <laughs> I just killed me some monsters and think I could go for a round of Gwent right about now. <laughs> <laughs> I I really appreciate when games, any game ever, acknowledges how ridiculous the premise is in some way. But like without being obnoxious about it. Like that that what you just said, that works perfect. Cause it's something that someone who's completely unaware of the ridiculousness of the situation might actually say, and yet it still points out how ridiculous the situation is. Oh, I love it. It's, it is quite ridiculous, because you could imagine going to, you know, a bar or something. There's a table, there's a... Apparently it's played on an apparatus, I mean... Yeah, it's like a game board or something. Right, so you can imagine some guy sitting there with his game board, and you sit down, you have a beer, you play in it, but... You run across the guy walking down the road with a backpack full of wares. The backpack full of, of swords. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to play a game of Gwent? It's like you're just gonna sit down in the fucking dirt <laughs> and start playing a card game. Well, it reminds it reminds me of like the goofy um, one-liners in Metal Gear Solid Three, where he's like he's eating snakes to survive, but he always comments on how they taste. Yeah. Like the milk snake, he's like. That tastes horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great. Like I just love that stuff. I've re I realized that my my Geralt voice is just my bad snake voice. And yeah. your Batman and voice. Batman. And to, Batman. Be, and Batman. to be fair, a bad Batman voice and a bad snake voice are exactly the same anyway. So I think I'm gonna install 
a digital console where I can play Gwent in my Batmobile. <laughs> <laughs> and then fight Psycho Mantis. And Jack Bauer. <laughs> oh, <hey. laughs> that was very... That was, uh, that was a thing we just did. That was disturbing. It, I can't argue. So right. anyways, Gwent. <laughs> yeah. Josh was talking about how he thought it was kind of frustrating that the characters in Gwent cards were characters who were in the game and like people didn't know who this guy is when they were carrying around trading cards. Is that true? I haven't played it backpack. that much. Yeah, no, like this guy will have a, a Geralt of Rivia card in his deck <laughs> and then you like sit down to play with him and he's not like, hey, you're the guy on my Gwent card. Sign my card. <laughs> like, it's just like, oh, you're a random guy who wants to play me. And like then he plays the, the Geralt card and you're just like... Which hey, not work that's me. <laughs> See, at least in like Final Fantasy IX and Final Fantasy VIII, the card games, the cards were all monsters in the world. Well, actually, that's not true. I remember uh, specifically having a Quistus card in Final Fantasy VIII uh, in Triple Triad. So I know there were some character cards in that in that game. Uh, in Final Fantasy IX, there aren't any character cards. It's all monsters and weapons, but. Tetra Master isn't as good a card game as Triple Triad, so I don't know if that counts. In Deadly Premonition, it was all the people in the town, but in the Deadly Premonition universe, I think that worked because it's like this goofy town where I could totally see them like making cards of their residents. The card game of the right. town. And... Right. Even though there's spoilers on the cards if you read them. I learned about one of the murders by reading the character's card. Oh, that's I never played it that much, but I do remember the cards, and I didn't realize there was an actual card game in there. I don't think there's a card game. I think it just oh, it's just cards. cards. Yeah. Oh, I see. My favorite cards ever that weren't a game but were a collectible were the stud cards from Shadow Hearts Covenant. Because so you had a character in in the game that made like a magical puppet. And in order to have the puppet have different elemental abilities, the puppet would need different outfits. In order to get the outfits, you would have to find stud cards, which were softcore gay porn, which you would give to the tailors, who would then make dresses for your doll. Mm. Also, the, the guys on the card were all really hot. <laughs> There was like Mr. Sommelier who had this giant wine bottle and the picture was just so obviously saying, yes, this is phallic and how do you like that? <laughs> There's almost a cock shot in The Witcher 3. Almost. Almost. There's cocks in uh, Outlast. Dudes walking around with weird rectangular penises. Now I kind of want it. I would, I would argue that the sexualization in The Witcher 3 isn't quite as ridiculous as the stud cards, but it is a little bit ridiculous. Um, it's just in being, like, unrealistic. The thing about the Witcher 3 that gets me is that it's every woman who dresses like that. I could buy it if it was just one woman, because maybe she was really proud of her boobs, but as is, it's a little much. CD Projekt Red just said, we're not going to give buttons to our female characters, yeah. and especially in the blousel region. Yeah. That, that was breaking my brain for a little bit. I thought there was going to be a nip slip every time that witch turned around. What's her name? It starts with a K? Kira. Kira? Kira. Yeah. No, I was so confused because I was sitting next to Josh while he was playing and like I couldn't figure out if I was just looking at her top wrong because it felt like nipples yeah. should be well, there. You could, you yeah. could see it. You could see it. Like, every time she shifted, it was like, wait, is that Ariel? And finally, yeah. Josh pointed it out, and I felt better about the world because Again, I didn't see it. As stupid as that is, and it's quite stupid, all I want is some cock bulge in return. See, I didn't That's come across uh, Triss until after the, the ultimate DLC. cock costume came out. Which was just ridiculous. It's like a peacock dress of some sort. Yeah, I actually like Tris's like J-Lo and, like, uh, base game outfit way better. Than I don't even know what it is. You can shut it off at the menu. Do you come across her more than... She's she's a pretty big part of the late Novigrad story. Yeah. And then she kind of has... Once you finish the Novigrad story, she kind of has her own story okay. that you can help her with or ignore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The Witcher 3 is just... So far, the best game I've played in a very long time. 
just when I started playing The Witcher Three, like you start out in that little village, yeah. and you walk through, and the then the, like the walkway is really narrow, mm-hmm. and there's all these geese running around. Yeah. You can look off to your right, and there's this field with a bunch of people working in it. You always see this, especially in like old school JRPGs. You always see these like massive fields, and no one's ever working in them. Yeah, and you don't see a lot of farm life and stuff happening in these towns, mm-hmm. but like. That there's so much detail in how you like run into the town and see the geese scatter and then go look and see the guy with the scythe, scything wheat or whatever he does with his wheat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you come across like one town where they're beehive guys. They're honeying. <laughs> yeah, gosh, man. I, I gotta say one of the most underutilized aspects of The Witcher 3 is the fighting. The fight clubs in that game are just... Ridiculous. It seems like every town you go to, the first guy you fight will always ask you to lose for him. <laughs> oh, my girlfriend's watching. I need money. It's like, what the fuck? I don't remember that happening in Novigrad, but I do remember that happening in Valen. The first guy you come across in Valen, I think, right? He yeah. says, is the fish catcher is his name or some shit? Yeah, he's, he's, he, he asks you to throw the fight. Yeah, and then... Um, and you don't, and your son becomes Daredevil. I believe it's in Novograd. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's in Skellige. I haven't, I, I haven't gotten to Skellige I just yet. was there. I yeah. accidentally went to the first mission. You just broiled in that. And... You're just, just wandering around Skellige like a badass. Yeah. You know, I do feel like the main reason I will never probably play The Witcher 3 is that I can't play as a female character. You yeah. can. In The Witcher 3, there are moments where you play as a female character. Moments. I can't make a female character. Well, but that's an argument for any game that doesn't allow you to make a character. And I don't play those games either. I think Geralt of Rivia, I think he's a pretty awesome character. I have a hard time playing role-playing games with open worlds where I can't be a female character. It has a lot of good, a lot of well-written I, female I, characters. I, I accept that. I'm, I'm not even arguing against that. But I have enough of having a dick in real life. Uh, I want to be a female character when I'm role-playing. That's what I want. Can Geralt wear dresses? Um, no. There's the guy who sells dresses, and he wears dresses. Yeah. yeah but I can't play him. Oh yeah, that guy. What's that guy's name? I, I was just—I just thought since he sold dresses, he plays Gwen. Since... He plays Gwen. He does play Gwen. Yeah. But but I can't buy dresses from him and look absolutely fabulous while I am clearing out a bandit camp. So no, Ger- I'm... Geralt always buys these these outfits, and then he complains about wearing them. He's like, "Ah, oh, this feels itchy." Yeah, well, <laughs> if Geralt was had the option to wear a dress, I would love to see it the kind of phrases that would come out of his mouth. Like, ah, oh, feels good to have that nice breeze yeah. on, my, on my dangly. What does he say? See, that would the be great. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, like, I, I fear that the lines would be, like, really sexist and transphobic, but if they were like, it feels good to have uh, the breeze on my dangly, I would, I would love the shit out of that. <laughs> Though like that, would be that a, kind that of would be a, like a good line. Like I, I acknowledge <laughs> that wearing a a dress and a skirt while having danglies is probably different while not having danglies. But <laughs> slow down, Roach. <laughs> the wind's picking up. <laughs> Looks like it's gonna rain. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think it's really interesting that you only want to play games where you can play as a female character or choose your character when you're speaking out in favor of retro games in which that I know right <laughs> I the most well, but there's a, re- there's a reason that the majority of my retro gaming experience has been JRPGs where there's at least usually the token female character and then I get to identify with her uh that's but you're completely right. There's a lot of retro games. I in fact there's most of the retro games where you don't get that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Well, I've been going through Nintendo games and categorizing them based on whether there's a playable female character or female lead or whether the plot is rescue your girlfriend. And, and I can tell you there's probably ten times as many rescue right. your girlfriend as playable female character and female lead. Combined. Of course, you know, I'm also the person that when you go, what was the best Mario game uh, ever? 
I go Mario 2. Doki Doki Panic. Yeah, right. I'm like, but oh, that's well, that was a Mario weird... game. Right. People say that, and I'm like, fuck you. I get to play as the princess. No, but you could do that. In but Mario. in Luigi was a female character in the original version of Doki Doki Panic. It had two playable female characters, whereas there's only one in right. Super Mario 2 because they changed uh, Mama and Doki Doki Panic to Luigi. Right. Super Mario 2. Mm. I feel like. One of the things that we get wrong when we're trying to have diversity uh, in gender in video games and in media in general is that we try to badassify women. You know, like you see all these uh, reimagined princesses and they're always like badass warriors. And I'm like, Princess Peach is not a badass warrior. She's a princess archetype. Why can't she be badass and be a princess? Her strength should be coming from the fact that she is, you know, the beacon of hope and light and love of her people. For some reason, nobody ever wants to look at that possibility because I guess the only way to be strong is if you kill shit with a sword. Is, is Princess Peach Princess Toadstool? Yes. Yes. I, I feel like we've completely gotten off The Witcher 3, but that's okay. It doesn't have enough cock bulge. That brings us to the final statement, which I will make. That's the pleasure that I have, the power that I hold. Did we learn anything? I don't know. I feel like I have. There's not enough cock bulge in anything, really. We've trained no dinosaurs. We've played Gwent. Good night and good luck. <laughs> <laughs>